Well, good morning. <clears throat> good to see you all this morning. I have some very good news about the weather before we start our Bible study this morning. The forecast is that by the end of the week, the wind will drop, the rain will stop, but the temperature is due to fall to minus two by the end of the week. I'm not inventing that. So wrap up warm for your visit to the big top morning by morning. Please will you come with a Bible if you possibly can uh, of whatever translation. I'll be using, as Steve says, the New International Version. And please open it now, if you've closed it again, at Daniel chapter 1. In the evening, we'll be looking at the Acts of the Apostles. But in the morning, every morning, we'll be looking at sections of this amazingly exciting Old Testament book, the book of Daniel. And this morning, we're going to do a study, almost verse by verse, through Daniel 1. Now, some of it will be hard work. I just want to warn you of that. There'll be distractions with the tent blowing and so on, uh, and quite difficult at times to get into the meat of this. But I want us to really allow the scripture to speak to us and to challenge us in this overall theme of singing God's song in a strange land. That's our plan. Now, of course, there are two aspects to this singing a song in this strange land, which I'd like you to have in your mind as you're reading through Daniel with me during the course of this week. Number one is a personal reality. And that is that many of us are finding ourselves in families or places of work or in towns or cities where we feel oppressed or crushed or frightened because almost no one around us shares our Christian faith and we feel very isolated and we feel like being a Christian is a really tough deal. Now, you may be in that particular situation. So, have that in mind as we go through, Daniel, the need for personal strength in a world that doesn't share our values. And secondly, there's a rather bigger context to this, which I hope will excite you and stimulate your prayers as the week goes on. And that is that Daniel is not just about an individual carried away into captivity, which, of course, that is what he is. But he is uh, a representative of the whole people of God taken away from the land they love, and they are now in exile. They're in a country whose geography they do not recognize, whose culture they do not share, and whose religious values are wholly alien to them. And we find ourselves... In 2005, in third millennium Britain, asking ourselves, how will the church in the Western world survive? Many of the statistics about church attendance are in free fall. In 10 years' time, if the figures continue to decline, some denominations we know about in Britain will simply have disappeared. Now, actually... The chances of that are relatively slim because a remnant of people tends to remain for a very long time uh, after the due date of death. But nevertheless, many signs are not good. Now, there are some really fantastic signs. Spring harvest is one of them. Some exciting people gathering together, wanting to know God's will. But the church in the Western world is in captivity. It is living in an alien environment. A relatively small percentage of people in the United Kingdom either go to church or espouse a biblical Christianity. So we're facing a challenge. We, we must wake up to that. And Daniel, through this week, will help us address both of those things. It will help us address personal challenge, where we work and live, and it will help us address the nature of the church's life in this third millennium in a Western world that largely doesn't share our values. And how are we to cope with that? So I think that's a pretty, a pretty exciting um, thing. It's hard on the first morning. You're wet and cold and you're only just sort of waking up. So just before I read you the first verse of Daniel, turn to the person next to you and say, this is going to be really exciting. All right, good, thank you. 
Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah, enough. I could have wished you said that with a little bit more faith. But, but thank you anyway. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. That's the opening, pretty depressing start to the whole story of Daniel. Lots of names here, aren't there, of, uh, of different people. Uh, the great challenge is, you know, just let me say this before I get into the meat of this, the great challenge is for us that we will always assume uh, that the word is somehow pertinent for somebody else. As if Daniel is not really addressed to us, because we, we may not feel particularly persecuted right now where we are. Or we might, but we wonder if God's actually going to bless someone else. I want to tell you that this book is addressed to you and to me. I can't resist telling you about a letter that I came across some years ago, which the Lambeth City Council had actually sent out, uh, trying to stop someone's benefit. A man called William Reynolds. This is a real letter. And they wrote to him, and I quote the exact letter that was sent to him. Dear Mr. Reynolds, your council tax benefit has been stopped because there has been a change in your circumstances. The change is because you are dead. <laughs> now, that is a real letter. A real letter. And there's even a following concluding paragraph that says this. You may appeal against this decision. <laughs> via our appeals hotline. What is that all about? This is clearly a letter sent to the wrong address. However, I want to tell you that Daniel has not been sent to the wrong address. It's addressed to you and to me, and we need to receive it and open its contents and read it avidly as it applies to us. Now, let's get into the meat of this Bible study this morning. I've read the first verse to you, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, the great Babylonian king, comes to Jerusalem and besieges it. So let me give you a little bit of flavor of the history so you know where Daniel fits, because it's really tough. Steve, in his introduction, rather uh, humorously said to you, Daniel is in the Old Testament. Actually, for many new Christians, it is a struggle to know where Daniel is and where he fits. About 150 years before this incident took place, the northern kingdom, the Israel kingdom, was taken away into captivity by the Assyrians. And so God's people had already been rather badly smashed up. And it was only the southern kingdom, the Judah group, from which Daniel came, that remained intact over this period. And in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, a growing power in the ancient world, a ruthless, vigorous dictator with enormous economic, political and military might, makes his way from Babylon, which is quite near modern-day Baghdad in Iraq, and comes in from the northeast and threatens Jehoiakim, who's nothing more than a puppet king, really. And then in three waves of attack, God's people in Jerusalem are seriously bushwhacked by this aggressor. In 605, Daniel is taken away into exile. In 597, there is a return invasion because the puppet king is behaving a little badly and needs smacking around the head again by the Babylonian overlords. And then in 587 fed up with the vassal king being irritating and annoying, the city is ultimately sacked and the temple destroyed and many people butchered and killed. Zedekiah, actually the king of the time, is rounded up, he's running into the hills and he is captured. He has his eyes gouged out as was the horrific pattern of the day 
He had to witness his two sons being slaughtered and was taken away back to Babylon. So this is a pretty serious time in the children of Israel's history. And so they're carried away into exile, four, five, six, seven hundred miles, depending on the route, back to Iraq, where Nebuchadnezzar finds himself as Lord. And so that's the situation. Daniel and his friends at home in Jerusalem, in Judah, whisked away by this powerful tyrant into an entirely separate setting. And notice verse 2, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some articles from the temple. Notice that throughout Daniel, and I want you to keep your eyes open for this, God is shown as in charge of human destiny. If you'd have been around at the time reading the Jerusalem Post, the Daily Times in Jerusalem, watching the BBC World Service, you would undoubtedly have seen the events of this century unfold from the point of view of an aggressive invader. Nebuchadnezzar's coming. He's bound to succeed. He's bigger, more powerful, stronger. Militarily, utterly without peer, he's going to win. No wonder Jehoiakim is defeated, crushed, abused. How could it be anything else? This is a massive nation against a piddling little nation. It's the United States of America declaring war on the Isle of Wight. This is no contest. And yet, throughout the book of Daniel, this kind of phrase continues to reoccur. And I offer it to you because it's true of your life and mine as well as Daniel. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim into his hand. There is something of his story in history. There is a divine element in the affairs of men and women. The general election for which we prayed a few moments ago is not simply an exercise in democratic accountability. It is that. But don't think for one moment, whatever the result of the election, that God is somehow sidelined by our political processes. I want to assure you, and Daniel wants to assure you again and again, that though the affairs of our planet might appear to be decided by Bush or Blair, or by a United Nations mandate, ultimately, in our world today, and Christians need to affirm this again and again, there won't be any peace until God is seated at the conference table. He is the Lord of history and the Lord of the world. And Daniel urges us not merely to see the events here as an accident of military might or economic prowess, but of divine intervention. It was the Lord who was involved in all this. The holy articles are carried off. And they went to the temple of his god, possibly a god called Baal or a god called Marduk, into the temple in Babylonia. And the Hebrew, if you've got the NIV version in front of you, and many of you do, what, what's, what versions are we using this morning? Who's using NIV? Okay, looks like the majority. What about good news? Okay, a few. Living or new living? The message? The Bible in pictures? <laughs> Not yet coloured in? No? Okay. If you, look at, if, you're, if you are in the NIV and you look at the bottom of your page under the notes, it says Hebrew, Shinar. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, Shinar is the old-fashioned name for Babylon. You know, in Africa, all these African countries, they... We went through a period in the 80s and 90s where they kept changing their names. And so Rhodesia became Malawi, exactly. And Salisbury became Harare, okay, and so on. And so the names associated with a particular colonial period in Africa, which people didn't like, and so they changed the name to more reflect the current culture. And so Shinar was the original name and Babylon was the new name. Now Shinar is particularly significant that this writer, 
calls it Shinar by its old name because this is the place where the Tower of Babel was, where that great sign, you remember the story in Genesis? The tower is built as a sign of rebellion against the living God. And so the writer is saying, where does this power of Nebuchadnezzar rise from? It's exactly the same place as the rebellion came from centuries earlier. Shinar, the site of the Tower of Babel, the site of rebellion against the living God. And so it's quite important that he puts these things, these little uh, things from God's temple, in his own temple. And that's going to be really, really important later on in the story, later on in the week, as we will see. Hold that thought. These Bible studies are just like a, a soap opera, really. Each morning I'll just leave you dangling having to come back the next day to find out if Deirdre did it. <laughs> so remember that. The, the stuff in the temple is going to crop up again. Bear that in mind as the week goes on. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, which, which may not have been his name, by the way. It may just have been a title, like a pastor or priest or home secretary or, it may, it, or head teacher. It, it may not have been a name, it may just have meant sort of chief eunuch. If you were in the big top this morning, you saw Ashpenaz um, portrayed as fat. Actually, there may be good historical precedent for that. Ashpenaz may have been a eunuch. Uh, and eunuchs, for reasons it's not appropriate to go into this morning, may have been fat. And often were. And indeed, rich people in the ancient world were often fat because they were weighted on hand and foot and because gyms had not yet been invented. And the physical labor was done by others. So Ashpenaz is the chief of the court and he brings in some Israelites. Shock horror. Israelites in Babylon in the royal court. Now, this is not at all uncommon in ancient dynasties. When you went round the ancient world, mopping up the little nations and conquering them, the way you meant... See, military conquest was one thing. You just kill everybody in sight. That's, that's, okay, relatively simple. But running an empire is pretty difficult. We know from contemporary experience that winning a war in Iraq was one thing, but winning the peace has proved rather harder. I'm not making a political point there. I'm just describing the difficulty of establishing rule that is orderly. And the ancient kings knew that. And so what they did was they subdued people by two methods, crushing military victory and inclusion. And so the royal families, particularly the young men, and, and these guys are probably in their late teenage at this phase, are drawn into the religious household and they are made part of the court in order that as the years go by, all these conquered cultures become assimilated into the great empire and therefore are less of a threat because they discover, as we'll see in a minute, all the ways of the Babylonians and become, as it were, no different and have a lot to lose by rebellion because they're given position of blessing. Here is this position of blessing. These Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. And then look at verse 4. It is a mother-in-law's dream. Young men without any physical defect, handsome and showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified. Where can you find a man like that when you're looking for one? There are only two examples in the Old Testament of this sort of handsome and beauty sort of treatments. One of them's here and the other is in Esther, where their train and their physical look, their handsomeness and their intellect is also valued. And so they were qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians, literally Chaldeans, which is a kind of slightly broader term. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were going to be trained for three years to enter 
the king's service. So here are these four guys who are about to be absorbed into this foreign alien culture. They're about to be part of the great Nebuchadnezzar project for conquering the known world. They'll be, and there'll be dozens of them, not just Israelite leaders, but there'll be dozens from conquered nations drawn into this royal court. And they're going to have three years of training. Among them, and then it lists their names in, in Judean, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and then the chief official gave them a new name. And it's from these names uh, that we get the old joke about your shack, my shack, and a bungalow. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, we get the names of these characters who play a significant part throughout the book of Daniel. Here they are, having these new names. And then verse 8. Now, I want to tell you that these chapters often have a pivotal verse, a key moment a kind of defining sentence which the whole of the rest of the chapter hangs on. And this is it. Verse 8. If you remember nothing else, verse 8 is the interpretative key to this chapter. Almost every theologian who's written on this chapter agrees with this. Because verse 8 is this moment of decision. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Daniel resolved. Now, in the Hebrew, the word resolved is extremely strong. Daniel was absolutely determined. Daniel had decided in his heart. It's a very strong phrase. It's not. Daniel woke up one morning and thought, hmm, perhaps I won't have the wine and the meat. It, it's, a, it's a conscience decision. It's a moral decision. It's a definite decision. It's a decided decision. Daniel resolved in his heart not to have the meat and the wine. Now, what's going on here? Is this an Old Testament advert for teetotalism and vegetarianism? Answer... No. Now, that's not to say that vegetarianism and teetotalism don't have things to commend them. It's just that this is not the point of this passage. So we come to the crunch now. And it is a crunch every one of us faces in the workplace. And it is a crunch our church, church in Britain faces all the time. Please let me explain why. Daniel and his friends are already compromised. How? They'd been drawn into the royal court. They could have refused to join. They could have, been, uh, they could have refused, and they'd have been probably killed or sent away somewhere into slave labor, but they could have refused. But no, they go into the royal court. Then they're treated really nicely, and, and they could have refused that nice treatment, but again, to what end, we don't know. They might have been punished or persecuted, killed, and so on. And then they're given new names. That act itself is oppressive and manipulative. Imagine you being contacted by some other country and whisked away, kidnapped perhaps, or our country defeated. You're taken to another land. People aren't very happy with an Anglo-Saxon name like Stephen and want to call you by another name, a name like Mohammed or a name which actually much more accurately represents another culture. You'd be offended, hurt. Your name defines who you are. Daniel doesn't seem to resist the change of name to Belteshazzar. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego seem comfortable with being given a new name. Another level of compromise. And what do they do? They're being taught in the ancient Babylonian arts. They go to the University of Babylon. And what will they be taught there? Make no mistake about it. They'll not just be taught the history of Babylon and about the gods, Marduk, and so on. They'll actually be taught about occult powers. They'll actually be taught about spells and dreams and a whole bunch of stuff we would consider to be weird, new agey, occultic. They're going to learn about all those things, and Daniel doesn't seem to utter a word against any of those. And yet, the day comes 
when Ashpenaz says, and you're going to get food from the royal table, and Daniel says, that is far enough. I will not compromise any further. Now, we don't know why he chose the food and the wine for the, for the, to draw the line. Was it because it had been offered to idols? Well, it might have been, but the vegetables would also have been offered. So, so it's very, very, very difficult to, um, to know what it was that's going on in his mind. It's actually, it translates a very difficult Persian word, the Hebrew, about royalty providing food for the royal court. It was common in the ancient world. This word occurs five times in this chapter, once later on in the book, and nowhere else in the Old Testament. It is an absolutely specific idea to the book of Daniel. And the, I think the most likely explanation is that Daniel said, I want to be an influence for Yahweh, the one true God, and I am prepared to enter the royal court, and I am prepared to learn about the Babylonians in all their things, even though I may not agree with it, and I am prepared to accept a new name, but there is a line I will not cross in compromising who I am in God and who I claim to be. And I will not cross that line. Whatever happens, I won't do it. And Daniel resolved in his heart that he wouldn't do it. And folks, there will come a point if we're going to stand up for Jesus Christ in our workplace, and I promise you there is coming a point for the church in Britain where it will have to say no further in terms of its compromises. And people draw the line in different places, and this is where we need humility and love for each other. How many of you remember, 20 years ago, the incredible film Chariots of Fire with Eric Liddell, the great runner, who refused to run on a Sunday? It brought him to the highest authority, not just the head of the Olympic Committee, but the royal family got involved in it, and he refused to compromise what he saw with his principles. Jonathan Edwards, in the early days of his triple jump career, felt exactly the same about Sunday observance. Now, for many of us, we may not feel that way, even as committed Christians, about the use of Sunday. We might have a different view. Christians do have different views on matters of principle. But we honour Eric Liddell, and we honour Jonathan Edwards, and we honour all those who draw a line and make a stand on Christian values. And we will have to do that, my brothers and sisters, even when we don't particularly agree where the line has been drawn. Because there does come a point when God seems to say slightly different things to slightly different people, but to all of them he's saying, make a mark in the sand and be prepared to stand up for me. Because what the devil will say to the church in Britain and will say to you and I is that each step, it's like salami tactics, each step, each slice, oh, it doesn't matter, this doesn't really matter, this doesn't really matter, this doesn't really matter. And then one day you will wake up and you will be absolutely no different from every non-Christian around you. So we are going to have to find places to draw the line. And we may disagree with each other. I know someone reasonably well who runs an entire chain of toy shops. When the Harry Potter films came out, he made a decision that his toy shops were not going to stop material that he saw as linked with the occult. Now, I have to say that myself, I took a very different view about the Harry Potter series. But I absolutely honor 100% the decision this businessman made. It cost him a lot of money and a lot of negative publicity to make what he saw was a moral stand. And although I personally would have a different view of, say, the Harry Potter series, I am absolutely thrilled that this businessman was prepared to take the hit financially and the mockery of his fellow business people in order to say, there are some things I will not do for financial gain. And I honor that and praise that man to the skies because it's the moral decision that he made. And part of the problem with the church in the UK today, and part of my problem and yours, is that there's a lack of conviction about the nature of the church. We see it all the way through our culture, don't we? 
The focus group mentality. Ask a politician what they believe. Many will say, what is it you want me to believe? Because, you know, as long as the vote comes, the mood can be changed, the policy changed to fit the mood of the electorate. My brothers and sisters, the thing about the gospel is this. You run all the focus groups you want. You ask any people you want about what the gospel is. God is not in the focus group business. He's not going to compromise. He's going to say what his laws and values are, and it's our job to bring our lives into line with them. And Daniel takes a stand at the royal food issue. And I think it's partly, it may have been its link with offered, being offered to the gods. I'm not sure. That may have been a feature. It may have been just that Daniel said, I can't. I can do all these compromises, but if I go any further, what I, what I am about for God is going to fall. So I, I can't do that. And it may have been simply that this food, the royal food, another, another translation of this word is rich food. And, and you can guess, can't you? Just think about it for a minute. The effect on these people's lives would be rich food. One of my very favorite desserts of all time, which even now I'm salivating, thinking about, <laughs> is I absolutely love profiteroles. Shoe pastry, chocolate, filled with cream, and then cream on top of the cream. Does, does, does nobody else re relate? To oh, good, oh, good, okay, some of you relate to that. My wife makes the best profiteroles in the world. Trouble is, she only lets me have half a dozen or so at a time. <laughs> now, the thing is, imagine, I, loving profiteroles as much as I do, this rich food, and imagine that I get up at spring harvest, and uh, we have a, a relatively early meeting, and I come back from that, and my wife has prepared for me a bowl of profiteroles for my breakfast. How many of you could eat profiteroles for breakfast? Yes. <laughs> Will my wife make them me for breakfast? See, all you women know that. You're just as sick as she is. That's why uh, the problem is, okay, right, you won't. Right. And then they come out again at lunchtime. And then they come out again in the evening. You see, in the end, rich food consistently would make us sick. It has to be balanced against other kinds of things. And part of the problem with the fatness in the ancient court was that rich food really wasn't that good for them. And so Daniel is experimenting and telling them about an experiment that is actually based in pretty good scientific principles. And he says to them, we want to avoid this rich food. Now God, verse 9, caused the official to show favor. The official said, the king's going to kill me if you look terrible. Well, I'm not going to, verse 11 says. Test us for 10 days and give us nothing but vegetables and water to drink. And actually, compared with profiteroles for breakfast, lunch and dinner, vegetables and water was a remarkably healthy diet. And so after 10 days, there would be a less bloated, less obvious uh, distension of the stomach. You can put on quite a few pounds, can't you, in 10 days. So they looked better. And so the day was won. But there's a, an interesting phrase here that I don't think made Daniel and his friends very popular. At the end of 10 days, they looked better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the God took their choice food and wine away. Oh, there. Well done, Daniel. That's a good way to win a popularity contest. So Daniel proves his point because God is with him in this alien culture. Daniel's desperate to sing God's song in a strange land. Yes, he'll give way about the foreign name. Yes, he'll learn about the foreign and alien culture. Yes, he'll get involved in the royal court in some way. And we ought to be glad he does because as we'll see tomorrow, he was incredibly beneficial. But no, he won't for whatever reason. Maybe it contained horse meat or pork or whatever uh, was alien to, to, to Jewish people. Maybe it was the uh, idols and who knows what it was. 
But Daniel is determined to prove his point, and he does. In this alien culture, he's going to say, the God of Judah, Yahweh, is just as much God seven, eight hundred miles away in Babylon, and I am not going to abandon him because he knows me now just as much as he knew me then, and his power is in Babylon just as much as it was back in Jerusalem. Now, folks, this is fundamental to our Christian witness. Isn't it easy to be bold for God now? As I preach, isn't faith rising within you? Don't you think about how easily you could convert the person sitting next to you right now? Doesn't that seem really easy? Look at them. Whoa, they're putty in your hands. You could sort them out, no problem, no question too hard, no conflict too difficult. You can do it. Now imagine your place of work and that miserable so-and-so who is your boss or the colleagues you work with or your unbelieving family. Imagine all of that and then say, now do you feel just as confident? The reality is not emotion, it's the spiritual truth that in the alien cultures of our workplace and our streets and our towns and villages, God is the same God as when we feel him in the context of our worship. Just because he's God in Jerusalem means in fact he's God in Babylon, in Shinar, in the center of evil. He's the same God. I was telling my congregation um, not long ago about a... Um, a wonderful story I read in the press talking of God being everywhere and uh, it was about the, about the internet actually and uh, did you see this story in the, in the press about Exmouth, the seafront at Exmouth absolutely fantastic for those of you who don't know where Exmouth is it's the sort of skegness of Devon uh, it's way down there in the southwest okay and what happened was some two burglars were trying to burgle a shop at 3.30 in the morning. Okay, so far, so normal. But what happened was they were being watched on the Exmouth webcam by a man called Andrew Pritchard who was watching the Exmouth webcam in Australia 12,000 miles away. (laughs) Now, what kind of sad man watches the Exmouth webcam (laughs) for entertainment. That's the first thing you should be asking. But So there's this bloke near Sydney in New South Wales. See, it's not 3.30 in the morning in Sydney, of course, but he's, for entertainment, he's watching the Exmouth webcam <laughs> on a wet and windy winter evening, night, 3.30 in the morning, and he sees these blokes trying to burgle. And he, he's on the net anyway, so he, he looks up on the net the phone number of the Devon police... He rings them up from Australia, this is absolutely true, and then he watches on the screen as the police arrive and arrest them. I mean, is that not amazing? That is absolutely fantastic. Talk about the all-seeing eye. I bet you've never had two more surprise burglars. Can you imagine them down the police station? How did you catch us? Oh, well, someone rang us from Australia. The ubiquitous camera, the range of the internet. Folks, the reality of Daniel is this. Our God is absolutely everywhere with his power, even when all the evidence appears to the contrary. Even when all the evidence appears to the contrary, our God is present and active in the shinars of our world where life is hellishly difficult and in Jerusalem, where life is relatively tranquil. And so the case is proved. Daniel and his four friends look fitter and healthier on their diet, which is not rich and opulent and indulgent. It's simple. Actually, uh, the word for vegetables isn't the normal word for vegetables. It literally means sown things. And it could have included breads of various kinds. So don't think for a minute they were living on some kind of lentil soup. It's rather more complex than that. 
Um, they were probably living on breads of various kinds as, as well as root vegetables and, and, and other things. And so Daniel says no to self-indulgent, affluent living, the fatness in more than one way of the royal court. And he says yes to a different discipline. He says yes to a different voice. His feet march to a different drummer. So those things help us when we are in difficult situations. But let me make a point about the church, which again I've been trying to make to our own church family uh, back in Gold Hill on several occasions recently. That the danger in our culture, the persecution we face, is not the rigorous persecution or the alien environment of a suffering church. We do not live in a suffering church in the way Daniel did. If Daniel misbehaved, he lost his head. None of us really live in that setting. I want to tell you that if this morning you lived in North Korea, or Laos, or Vietnam, or Bhutan, or Saudi Arabia, or one of a dozen other countries, your Christian faith would be persecuted. 200 million believers worldwide endure persecution of the Daniel kind. Most of us... No pressure, irritation, frustration, mockery, a bit of manipulation. We might be overlooked for something. But it's a different kind of pressure. And actually, Daniel helps us. Because Daniel appears to have been relatively respected with his three friends. And what he refuses to do is not be bludgeoned to give up his faith. That's genuine persecution. Daniel refuses to be seduced into losing his Christian faith. I want to tell you this. I believe that those of us in the Western world are not in danger of being bludgeoned into losing our faith. We are in danger of being seduced into losing our Christian faith. And we are in just as much danger as those experiencing persecution in all the countries I've just named. Halfway through the last century, two men vied in their writings to describe what the future of Britain would look like. One of them, George Orwell, wrote a book, 1984, in which he saw brutality, doublespeak, the crushing of life and values under totalitarian regimes. He saw a world in which books would be banned. His rival was a man called Aldous Huxley, who wrote a book called Brave New World. And in this new world, the drug Soma is taken It's a seductive, ease-making drug. And Huxley's world was not a world where books would be banned, but a far more insidious world, a world where no one would want to read. And brothers and sisters, we are in a deeply seductive world. To use the words of Neil Postman from his book, we are amusing ourselves to death. We are a world obsessed with indulgence, We're a world obsessed with trivia. We're a world obsessed with all sorts, particularly in the West, with all sorts of things that even if we just woke up, we would suddenly remind ourselves, God, where are you in all this? It's it's just nonsense. It's not what you're about. Watch sometime, turn the TV on and flick channels and just watch commercials for an entire evening. I never tire of telling the first time I saw the commercial, the breathless, excited commercial of having two bottles. I remember the commercial saying, see, years ago, it said, now there's no need to take shampoo and conditioner into the shower. The the, the announcer was breathless with excitement and anticipation. Now you can get two in one, shampoo and conditioner in the same bottle. And you could tell it was, it was almost a religious experience. <laughs> you mean, I can have shampoo and conditioner in one bottle? Oh, thank you, Lord. I mean, what is wrong with it? And what is wrong with that idiot woman who keeps coming across our screen, playing with her hair, telling us she's worth it? What kind of world are we in? We're in a world of self-indulgence, a world where where we have far more choices on our supermarket shelves than we've ever had before, and a a third of the world has not got enough to eat. What kind of world is this? It is a world that Daniel would have rebelled against, 
And notice, Daniel is not about to be bludgeoned into losing his Yahweh faith. He's about to be seduced. There are two ways for you to be manipulated to change your behavior. I can threaten you or I can bribe you. Many Christians in the 200 million are being threatened, but the church in the West is being bribed and seduced by the evil one. We've got a terrible challenge facing us in the next 20 years in the UK if we're not to be fat and flabby as a church, insipid, innocuous, and incredibly ineffective. The radical cutting edge of gutsy discipleship which Daniel showed, a line drawn in the sand wherever it is, doesn't seem to be happening. Brothers and sisters, as a church, we're going to have to wake up to this challenge. So, verse 17, and this was the verse in the Big Top this morning at Good Morning at Big Top. To these four young men, God gave, see, is God again, intervening in this Babylonian nonsense. He gives them knowledge, understanding, learning, literature. Even Daniel gets the special supernatural gift of understanding dreams of all kinds. This is going to be important tomorrow. Remember that. You and Deirdre come back tomorrow to learn about why that's a significant little phrase. And at the end of the time, the king's verse 18, he sent for them, the chief official came, presented them to Nebuchadnezzar, who was dead impressed. And none of them could equal. And then notice this. The writer records their Hebrew names, not their Babylonian names at this point. They were incredibly impressed with, with who? With Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Hebrew names. Why? Because, you see, they'd drawn a line somewhere. And somehow it's as if the writer is telling us the essential people about who they are hasn't changed. They really are still God's people. Superficially, they may have enrolled in the University of Babylon. Superficially, they may have been given a new name. But in their hearts, they're walking with God. In their hearts, they haven't compromised. In their hearts, they're true to the one living, true God. In every matter of wisdom, verse 20 says, and understanding the king questioned them, he found them ten times better. The phrase in Hebrew is actually ten hands. They were ten hands better. It's taken from the phrase where you serve meal out of a sack with your hands and you give portions to people who are poor. And so there were ten handfuls better. Daniel was ten times better than any of these other rich-fed kids in the king's court. And then verse 21, notice this, this, this whole introduction to Daniel is summarized in a sentence which you'll miss if you don't pay attention. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. That's it. Now, what is, folks, that is absolutely stunning. That is over 60 years. Nebuchadnezzar comes and goes. Belshazzar comes and goes. Darius comes and goes. It's amazing. How long does a prime minister last in the United Kingdom? Don't say too long. <laughs> People like Margaret Thatcher have a long reign. People like Tony Blair have had a relatively long period in prime ministerial office. But 60 years as the equivalent of Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer all rolled in to one. Daniel had one boss that went mad, one that was murdered, and all the intrigue of an of a Oriental dynasty. How did he survive? An incredible feat of survival for Daniel. How did he stick with it? Through all the tempestuous changes of military manoeuvring, economic upheaval... Years of famine, years of success. I mean, just amazing that for 60 years. And so the writer tells us, when he was a teenager, he drew a line in the sand. And he said, I will not go across that line. And the reward was for 60 years in an alien environment, in a foreign culture, in a fake culture, in a culture where occultism and false gods were everywhere, God honored that man, and for 60 years he made a difference in a very hostile, very difficult environment. And through this week, we're going to learn to sing the song of God in a strange land, and will be the Daniels God longs for us to be. God bless you.